in a different way, um, and we will have a Q&A. So I'm going to try and keep it sort of under 40 minutes, I mean under 30 minutes. So we've got a Q&A. So if there's some questions that you're thinking about as I'm sharing, please ask them. And, and remember, there is no stupid question. I promise you, if you're thinking, oh, this is stupid, somebody else is thinking the exact same thing. And when you share, they're going to think, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to ask. Okay. Is that all right? Wonderful. Of the people here, how many of you, if, if I could be bold and ask you, feel that the prophetic is your primary gifting? Okay, not, not too many, huh? Eh? Okay. So the, the session that we do is how to build a prophetic culture, okay? Which, which is actually a, a complete misnomer because you can't really build a culture. A culture is actually a derivative uh, of the beliefs, really what happens. It, it filters down. It's the fruit of the, the, the general beliefs in a place, in a system. So it always works out because your actions follow your beliefs and the culture gets made of repetitive actions. Anecdotal little things that people do. Um, if you go to America, you'll notice things that are different to here. If you go to, I've just come from Madagascar. And, you know, I just want to say this. If you're concerned that South Africa, the infrastructure is falling apart, just go to, go to Madagascar or another country. And this is one of the slickest countries I know. Everything just works. It's just beautiful. But I, um, I will share one thing. I got, um, on the second last night, I got food poisoning. And I just want to say, for the first time in my life, I passed a, a piece of broccoli through my right nostril. Never again in my life. Never, ever again in my life. It was, it was terrible. But anyway, we did recover enough to, to get back. Okay, so when we're going to talk about something, I, I really like to simplify things. I'm a simple bloke. Keep it simple. I'm a man as well, so you can't remember more than four things. So we're going to talk about four things, and, um, and it's going to be simple and practical. I think it's always um, four simple questions. Why? Always a good place to start. I like, and if you read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, it's always a good thing. Before you do anything, know why. So why a prophetic culture? That's um, how a prophetic culture, or what is a prophetic culture? Why is a prophetic culture? What is a prophetic culture? Who? And then obviously the what. Those are the four things I'm going to talk through and hopefully give you some, some tips, some ideas, and please um, keep remember questions. So for many of us, depending on, on the, the, the stream that you're in, the prophetic is like a nice to have. It's an add-on. It's like, oh man, it's like, an, you know, if you've got a little bit of cash when you're buying your car, you can spec the add-ons. And, and I think some of us think like that, that sometimes the gifting, the add-ons to have to our Christian walk, but the real meat, the real meat is in, in the walking out and the values and system. So we look at that, but I want to ask the question, why do we want to build a prophetic culture? And I want to start theologically, and I want to start... Uh, biblically and at like 30,000 feet and then just work my way down. Very, very simple. It's not going to be deep. It's just going to be simple, simple, simple. So why build the prophetic culture? So number one, if you follow theologians, and when I would say conservative theologians, so that's what we would call mainstream theologians, they will tell you that the primary way that we, scripturally, that we prove the authority of scripture the deity of Jesus and the existence of God is through fulfilled prophecy. It's interesting. But it's an add-on. No, it's not. It's core to our belief system. It's core to our Christianity. The primary way that theologically you can prove the deity of Jesus is through fulfilled prophecy. The primary way you can, you can um, sp speak about the authority of Scripture is through the, the, the fulfilled prophecy that it contains, the prophecy and the fulfillment of it. And the same, actually, for the existence of God. So from 30,000 feet, 
the prophetic is core in the Bible. It's core. It's right through Scripture, and I'm going to show you that. And it's fundamental to what we believe as Christians. It's absolutely fundamental. So um, if you read the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, you'll know, obviously most of you have already, that there's 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament. 1,239 and there are 578 in the New Testament. So that makes a total of 1,817. And 8,352 verses contain prophecies or prophetic. So it's, it's not an add-on. It's core and it's central. So it, that brings us back to why build a prophetic culture, because it's, it's central to our faith. Prophecy is built in right from the very beginning, all the way through Scripture. It proves who Jesus is. It validates the authenticity of Scripture. It's like it's there all the way. And then we think, oh, we're at an age of enlightenment. We can live without it. It's silly if we do that. The third thing I want to talk about, Matthew uh, 5.17, is uh, Jesus did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but he came to fulfill it. There's 324 specific prophecies, messianic prophecy, sorry, 324 prophecies about Jesus, and 48 of them are specific messianic about Jesus being the Messiah. And he fulfilled every single one. And so when he's saying, I came to fulfill the prophets, it's like he knew the prophetic words about him, and he, it's like he partnered with the Spirit of God in fulfilling the prophetic words about him. I think you could, there's a lot that you can read in and look into that. It's very, very powerful. Then, coming down a little bit more, Joel 2.28. We all know that. Who knows Joel 2.28? Kirsten's smiling. Do you want to quote it quickly, Kirsten? Sons and daughters will prophesy. Eh? And it was in Acts 2, verse 16 to 18. So Joel in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, under the law, begins to prophesy. What is he prophesying about in Joel 2? About the New Covenant. That's what he's prophesying about. He's prophesying about the New Covenant. And then in, in Acts 2, at Pentecost... It's like that is the inauguration of the church. Okay? And everyone's like, what's going on here? Spirit of God's breaking out. There's chaos. It's so chaotic. Everyone's thinking the people are drunk. Peter has to stand up and he says, hey guys, this is what Joel prophesied. This is it. These are the last days that Joel prophesied about. We're in them. And let's just read that. I don't know where I put my phone. I think I left it in the car. That's a great start. Does someone want to, does someone want to read Joel 2? He's got a Bible that can. That is a. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Can I do that? Sorry, man. Yeah, I can. I can. I can. I don't know where I've left my Bible. Joel 2.28. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show the wonders of heavens and on the earth. And it carries on. But what we can see Joel prophesying is that a consequence of the Spirit of God being poured out on all men is prophecy. It's a consequence of it. It's, and he's linking that, he's speaking that in the new covenant, the Spirit of God will be poured out, which is what we have now, the baptism of the Spirit, and men and women and sons and daughters will dream dreams and will prophesy. 
we have to be building a prophetic culture to facilitate that. Okay. Then the last point I want to make around it is 1 Corinthians 14 is Paul talking to the Corinthians in his treatise on, on, on the spiritual, the spiritual gifts. And he speaks about prophecy builds up the church. So if we're about building up the church, we have to have the prophetic in our midst. And if you read on a little further, well, in Ephesians 4, when uh, Paul is talking about the, the ascension gifts, so the, the fivefold ministry, and the, the point of the, the prophet in that is to mature, build up the church, and bring maturity to the saints. So everywhere, it's just all the way through Scripture, we're seeing this, this kind of, this is not something we can put to the side. And yet so many of our churches, it's like prophecy is an adult. But it's core to who we are. If we're wanting to build up the church, we wanting to have the Spirit of God in us, flowing, making a difference, we need the prophetic. Okay, so that's the why done. The second thing is, um, what is a prophetic culture? This gets a little bit more interesting because um, how long is a piece of string? You know, it's really, it's very, very difficult to say what a prophetic culture is because every single church represented here will have a different culture. And for me to say, uh, being a Glenridge church, hey, this is what the prophetic should look like in your church is silly because it's just not going to be like that. You can't, you can't do that. It's just, it's not, you're going to start looking at what other people are doing and say, well, they're doing better than we are. They're doing more than we are. And it, it gets, it just gets all wrong, you see. To answer what a prophetic culture is, it's not answered in the realm of our practices. It's answered in the realm of our values. What does your church value? Because that will come out in its practices. It will. So you have to look at your values, the church values. What are you doing? You can't. Um, many years ago, I, I did a stint as a, as a business coach for my sins. And... We thought we'd be quite unique, and, and that was early in the days when culture became the buzzword, and we thought we would, um, we would kind of differentiate ourselves by being the culture experts. You know, we, we got a couple of uh, gigs here and there with companies to come and help change their culture, and um, we would come in, and, and we, to be honest, as much as we tried, we wouldn't shift the culture because we didn't understand this that you can't change behavior without changing beliefs and values, values, growth, and beliefs. So we were working on the wrong level. It's kind of like trying to get oranges to grow up an apple tree. It's just not going to, you can do whatever you want. You can stick the orange, you can stick an orange seed, you can do whatever. It's not going to come. You have to work at the level of the tree and you change the tree and then the fruit changes. And so culture in many senses, is a fruit of, of a value system and the practices that you do in your church. So as you, as you value the prophetic and as you, you, you say, this is what we're going after, as with your team and that, you'll begin, your practices will begin to change. And you can see what a, a family's values are. If you, go and, if you go and spend time with friends or whatever, you spend a weekend in their house, and if I had to quiz you, you would be able to answer for me exactly what their values are by how they do things. Do they eat together as a family? Do they all sit in front of the television? Do they do this? Do their children help with the chores? You'll see all the values come out in the practices. So to, to say, what is a prophetic culture? Prophetic culture is actually a culture where the prophetic is valued in that environment. And then what it plays out will look different in every single environment. I head up the, the prophetic team at Glenrich here, and there's probably about, there's about 20, 20 of us on the team. And I want to tell you there's not one person who's the same. Not one way they prophesy, the way they see things, what they see, they're all different. And, and, and that's with 20 people. Imagine with 20 churches with 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 each church. It's just you can't, you can't clone these things. You grow them by changing the value. Okay. So what you see in a, in a culture is always the values expressed of that culture. 
what you see in a church, how they do things. You look at a church and you see they do that, that will be some expression of their value. They're doing something different to the way you would do it. And that's okay. That's okay. We get, I think we get so caught up on style, and actually the, the question's always around the value. Okay. So, the who question. Now, as I said earlier, we started that little um, coaching business and doing, trying to change um, cultures. We, we were the culture specialists and um, failed miserably. And one of the things we, there's two ways that we failed. The one way was that we, we, were, we were trying to implement culture on the level of practice and not on the level of value. And the second thing that we failed is that very often the people that got us in were either the marketing team or the, often the HR team and say, hey, we really need to change the, the value of the company. And so we'd come in and work not with the top leadership, but with the second tier leadership. And, and this is the truth. The leadership's values, beliefs, and theology determines how the prophetic in a local, determines how prophetic a local church's values are. That's it. I mean, a local church's culture, sorry. Culture is determined on a leadership level. It can't go the other way. If it goes the other way, it is uninvited leadership, and we all know what uninvited or unauthorized leadership is. You know, there is a level of leading up, but if you're, you're convinced that you're going to change your leaders to do things your way, either your heart is wrong or you're in the wrong church. One of those two things. Okay, so cult culture is, a, is, a, is set up by the leaders. I mean, when, when, when I, I'd been at Glenridge, we'd come out of a situation, we had been at Glenridge a couple of years, and and Stan had asked me to, to take up the prophetic group here. And I was like, um, okay. And I started doing this thing, and I keep going back to him, hey, Stan, I want to do this, are you okay with that? I want to do this, are you okay with that? And eventually he, he kind of sat me down and said, hey, Hilton, listen. I asked you to lead this group because you carry something. If I wanted to lead the group, I would lead it. But I don't carry what you carry, so can you please be free to do what you want to do? And I was like, and it was at that moment that I realized that, that the leadership opened the door and then we could start doing this thing. And it literally, the prophetic just took off in Glenwood. It was absolutely amazing because he understood. He had all, the leadership, had, he wanted it and he had authorized it and he had released it. Now I want to say this as well. If you are in leadership and you are not prophetic, that does not mean you cannot have a prophetic culture. It doesn't mean that at all. In our, leader, in our prophetic team, it is to, I'm not the most prophetic person on the team. I'm called to lead the team, and I'm settled with that, I'm happy. But there are some high-level prophetic people that, that I like. I'm amazed that sometimes when they prophesy and the things they come up with. And I'm comfortable with that. They're high-level, they're gifted in the prophetic, but they're not called to lead the team. And at the same time, if you're not, if you're not, if you're in a, if you're not prophetic, you, but you've got to know that this is what God, God's giving you. This You can be profoundly settled and comfortable and secure that God's called you to lead the church, and you can raise up guys who are prophetic. And one doesn't cancel out the other. It really doesn't. So when you, if you're leading an environment and you're not prophetic, it doesn't mean you're not going to be prophetic. Partner with people. Get other, get other prophetic teams in from other, other churches. Use resources. I mean, it's one of the things of belonging to a bigger picture is that we have resources that we can pull on. And there are so many good resources that are not always advertised. Ask around and you'll have pe there's people with tr who can do training. We've just been up at, we've been working with a church in Ermelo and in, in, in here, CAC, in Adamalua, as they say, you know, they, when I said I'm going to Ermelo, they didn't know what I was talking about, you know. So, as they said, no, it's Adamalua. So I said, okay. And, and they are hungry for the prophetic. And so, just before COVID, we started, we started connecting with them, and then COVID came, so they wanted us to train them, and we did these Zoom calls every so sort of once a month through COVID, and the relationship just developed, and the relationship developed, and, and it got to the point where this last um, time Tyron was up, they actually came, and they said, hey, we want to be part of this, what you guys are doing, and they, they're stepping away from the NTI, and they're joining this, not, not because it's an NCMI thing, but because... They want what we carry, and, and that's a beautiful thing to do. But we're sharing it, and we're loving it. 
So leader, culture is, um, is a leadership function. Okay. And you can only lead in the sphere that God has given you. Now, can I just say this as a, as a really helpful thing? And I'm sure there are lots of leaders here. When there are, there are, there are two spheres. There's a sphere of leadership that you're trying to curate politically and doing the right thing and smiling at the right people and, and amening the right leader so you can get yourself. And then there's the sphere that God has given you. When they don't equal, it's going to be pain in your life and conflict. In your life. When God gives you things, he gives it to you and no one can take it. But if you grab it, you've got to hold on to it. And I want to say that's hard work. So if you're straining in your call or whatever you're doing, you're probably holding something that shouldn't be yours to hold. Maybe let go, step back, and let God begin to advance you. Because when you're walking around, not that it's, it's always easy, but there is an ease to it. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to be anything. You can just rest and allow God to go. Okay. One other thing I want to just add on that thing. If you're prophetic and you're not, not on the leadership team, the most profound thing that you can do is honor your leadership. And stay tagged to them and listen to them and be under them. Even, and don't have this thing, well, they're not really prophetic. What are they going to show me? They're going to show you all the important things about character. They can see into you. And if they say, oh, they're not releasing me, they're holding me down, well, probably because you've got some character issues in your process. Go and ask them. Seriously, if you feel like you're being held back, go and say, hey, Steve, I'm really wanting to push through, but it feels like whenever I ask, I'm, I'm not getting any gaps. Is there a reason? And you They'll tell you the truth. I mean, you've got something to work on. Process. And th that, doing that, is, is that's the powerful, you build culture like that powerfully when you, when you submit and people see that. And you change and you grow and you step in. And that's what creates momentum in an environment, is having people that tuck in and want to push, push beyond. So I want to say one other thing around that. And, and I want to say this very carefully. That if you feel that you're called prophetically, if that's your primary gifting, and, and the, ch the home churches you're in, the environment you're in, are anti the prophetic. Now, I'm not saying they don't do the prophetic like you would like me to do it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're anti the prophetic. You have to ask either you've misheard what your calling is or you're in the wrong environment. And go and have a conversation because it's, it's not wrong. It's not for us to say they're wrong and I'm right, but hey, God, this is what I'm feeling in my life. Do you think it would be facilitated in this environment? And if he says, probably not, so well, I need to move. And, and leave, leave on good terms. You need to steward what God has given you. And the gifting, our gifting and our call is one of the primary things that we need to steward. And the problem is most of us don't really know what our primary gifting and calling is, and we don't know what we're stewarding. But if you read the parables of Jesus, nearly all of them are about stewardship. When you, Jesus wants to say, well done, good and faithful. The good part is easy. What is the faithful part about? It's about what you were given. Not what my neighbor was given, not what my wife was given, not what my children was given, but what I was given. Whether it was one talent or 50 talents. What did you do with what you were given, Hilton? Oh, but you know, the church I was in, they didn't really believe in the prophetic. Or this or that. No. We need to take ownership of what God's called us to and, and be mature in this and not be sulky and like little children and take brave steps and have strong conversations with leadership and find out what's real. Don't dance around the truth. It's not right. It's not good. It's not helpful for your leadership, and it's not helpful for you, and it doesn't actually build a culture of truth. Is that okay? Do you get what I'm saying? You know? if, you, if you don't like what I'm saying, just get hold of Stan. He'll be here later. He'll fix everything. And then finally, the how question. All things fall apart with the how. Not what you said, not what you did, it's how you did it, nearly always. You can say things 
in a, if you say things in the right way, you can get away with murder. True. Yeah, I, I run a business, so I know that, you know. It's how you say things. And so the how is where things fall apart very, very often. So I want to say some things about the how. The first thing is this. Matthew 13, 57, we, know, we should all know the story. Jesus goes back to Galilee and they're kind of, they're all celebrating him. Hey, this is, but then it's suddenly the tone changes. It's not this Joseph. Suddenly they, they de-esteem him. They are offended by him. And he says, well, a prophet's not without honor in his own hometown. And the next thing is, the next line is very interesting. And he could not do many miracles there. We all know that thing. Think about this. The creative universe, the flow of heaven's power is halted by a lack of honor. It's fascinating that. And it, it, honor will not flow where there's offense. Life will not flow. And so the point I'm making is honor is like the riverbanks of the life of God. It flows. So I could be sitting here. Let me show you exactly how it works. I could be sitting here and talking the very words of heaven and revelation from wherever. And if you're sitting there and you've got an issue with me for whatever the reason, yeah. You know, none of us have ever done that, but let's just, we probably know someone who's done that. And, and no matter what I say, you're getting nothing. You're, getting, you're going to walk out of here and get absolutely nothing. I, I could waffle for 44 minutes of my thing and say one intelligible thing. But if you're sitting there in humility with honor open, you will get that plus more. And you'll come away and say, when Hilton said that, that a total difference in me. Life flows through honor. So one of the most important things we have to guard our hearts is the offense that we carry. We all carry offense. We have to guard that and we have to make sure we deal with our stuff every single day and we, we, we come with honor. So that's, the, that's one of the key things about the how. The second thing is 2 Corinthians 5.16, we no longer regard people of the flesh. You wanna, we want to build a culture. We have to not see people in the natural. Let me just say, someone comes along and you know their history, you know they've had an affair three months ago, they've done this, they've had a drinking problem, they've done this, they've done that. And you are, they, they're coming right, they're doing the thing, and they come, hey, Hilton, I've got a word for you. I'm looking at him in the flesh. I'm not going to hear what God said. I'm just not going to get it. And I think Bill Johnson says it this way, God has a wonderful habit of packaging what you need in the most offensive package you can get. So if you really zigged with somebody... Maybe just sort your heart out and go and say, hey, have you got anything for me? Because it's probably waiting there for you to come to sort yourself out. So we, but, but the thing is this, when it comes to the prophetic, we can see people in the natural, and we need to see people about who they are in Christ, the new creation that they are. And we need to call things out. We need to look for things. We need, to, we need to expect things to happen. And I promise you, when there's an expect, it's like faith. When there's an expectation, you draw things out of people. It's just, just amazing. You just draw things out of people. So we need to look at things differently. So in culture building, when you have somebody in your environment that does something that's noteworthy, that catches your eye, see that and go and do something with that. It's so, so important because that's the very next point I'm going to do. So, um, you grow what you affirm. So if you want something in your family, in your home, in your business, in your church, affirm it. When you see things happen, if somebody, I mean, somebody comes up and shares for the first time, and they're trembling and they do their thing, but you can see something in that person. Wait a day or so, or then and give them a ring. Hey, that was amazing what you did. I am scouring all the time anyone doing anything to see what's coming out of it, and so I can go and pull that out. And, and let me tell you, there's, there's one particular lady in, in Glenridge. She's three-quarters from the back row, quiet thing. She shared once, and I'm like, 
oh my word, the authority that she carries. I'm like, I went to her and I said, when are you preparing your next prick? She's like, nearly fell over backwards. I think she didn't come to church for about six weeks after that. <laughs> but, but what I, I, I intentionally meant to scare her because I said, there's a call in you to speak. When you speak, people listen. And she's like, she had never heard that before. Never thought of that before. And, I, and every now and again, I catch her house again. She's like, I'm nearly, nearly finished. I'm nearly finished. So when you're finished, I'm coming with you. Me and you, we're going to stand. And you're going to tell him you're ready to preach. But I can't do that. I said, no, because you've got to be confident enough what God has given you. And you've got to say, I'm ready. If he says, thank you, but no thank you, you've done what you're called to do. But you've got to do that. And so we've got, we've got, to, we've got to affirm things. We've got to help people along. We've got to get people going. And then the final thing is we, we have to value, especially, this is especially for the prophetic, we have to value risk over success. Now, all the pastors in the room are going, <laughs> and, and part of training our people is to process prophetic words. So if somebody shares a prophetic word, and it is like, wacko. help the person who's got it to process it. You don't have to flush it. Flush it down the toilet. Do what I did in Madagascar, you know. Just eject it. <laughs> Get rid of it. But then go to the person and, and, and help them fix what they've done. And, and it's, we can't leave things hanging out there. You know, it's like when somebody steps out in the prophetic, or somebody steps out, it's like this, nobody knows what to do with it. And that is the most unhelpful thing you can do. Or when somebody makes a boo-boo in church or like totally bombs a meeting with the word of something, there's, everyone's looking down and nobody knows what to do with it. Address it. If it's public, you address it publicly, but kindly and helpfully. You say, okay, wow, we really appreciate Mary doing that, but that really, you know, but we're going to go this way. Mary, thanks for that contribution, and you move on. And if there's something that is powerful, this is the other thing if you're leading. Remember prophetic, I mean, um, culture is about values. When there's a powerful prophetic word that, that kind of comes in a, at a time in a meeting, and you just carry on with your program. What you're saying is we don't value the prophetic. Either, now I want to suggest, if you don't allow, want that to affect your program, don't allow the prophetic, because what you're doing is you, you're inoculating people against believing in the prophetic, because if the leadership in the church hear the prophetic, and they don't pay any attention to it, and, but they don't address it all, because either it was prophetic or it wasn't. If it was prophetic, you're now being disobedient carrying on, if it wasn't, then address it. But address it because it, it tells the people feel safe when you when you don't leave things hanging, and it helps people. And the and the final thing is is that I want to just say is I've got lots of other bits and pieces to say, but I, is the prophetic is a journey, and you you it's it's a road that you walk, and it's it's always it's never about you. And it's always about the people you talk to. And if you just remember that, it's not about the feedback you get. It's not about the recognition you get. It's not about anything. And all, prophesy, especially as, you, as, you, as you're learning, prophesy in a way that gives people permission to disagree with you. Don't say the first time you're prophesying, the Lord says this. If you don't obey, it's, you're going to be in trouble. It's like, how do you argue with God? You know, rather say, hey, this is what I feel God is saying, so that you give them permission if they don't agree, say, well, thank you, I'll, I'll go and take that with, with my leadership or whatever. Okay, that was the running out of time. Any questions? Was that helpful? Yeah. 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 Abs well, there's, so the gifts of the Spirit are from the Spirit. Okay, the gift to prophesy. The Ascension gifts, the, the office of the prophet is, it seems to be a gift from Jesus. So, but it is absolutely a gift from God. So prophecy, all of us can prophesy. It's the only thing we're all told to eagerly desire. It. So everyone can prophesy. It's the, and the level that you can prophesy depends on the gift that you're given. And, and I think more importantly, how you nurture what you were given. Because we're all given something small in a seed form. And the difference between someone who is able to eloquently hear God and speak powerfully is they've probably done it 500 times wrong and learned the, prepared to learn. The one who isn't is like, I'm too shy to make a mistake, so I won't, I won't try.
Is that any other questions? Yes. Sorry. Can leadership control um, an outbreak of Holy Spirit in prophetic? In other words, dull everything down to such an extent that it doesn't work within a meeting. Oh, absolutely. The le the leadership control the meeting. They they are the godly appointed authority in the meeting, and and so they have to. They can only lead in their faith level. So if somebody comes out of left side and has got something, and he hasn't got faith for that, he can't go there. He can't. It would be, and it's okay for him to say, you know what? And it's not saying you're wrong, I'm right. It's saying I'm leading the meeting, and I don't have faith for that, and I'm not. But if, if you've had a relationship, and you trust the guy, and you've be, he's been around, this is, not, this is not his first time, he's arrived at church in the morning, and, and he's ready to you know, say we've got to swing from the rafters, you know, and you're like, hang on but if, if you've been together you've trust and there's no shortcut to relationships and there's no shortcut to trust prophets need to earn leadership's trust not the other way around you know if you want to operate an environment you must be trustworthy does that kind of answer your question yeah. so absolutely one last one yes Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 quite difficult because it it really depends on on the church. So, like, if if you're a church that is is intentionally and that's Heather waving at me and she's giving me the hair. You're a church that, and that is intentionally, um, you, you're going for something that's, and the prophetic, what you will feel like the prophetic's not helpful in that. So it's not that you don't value it, it's you're going that way. So let me just say what I know about Glenridge. So Glenridge, we have, in essence, an open microphone on a Sunday, where if you feel something God has given you, you can go up to the leader, you can, you can um, share it with him, and he'll either give you a, a spot to do it when the appropriate time but the thing is this we're pre the leadership are quite prepared for meetings to bomb because they value the prophetic it might be for other people that it's more important that the people experience something of the presence of god in another way than through the prophetic so they wouldn't allow that so it's neither right nor wrong that's why i'm saying you can't say oh this is right this is wrong so but w where you see if you come to glenrich on a sunday you'll Within a month, you would have got a word from somebody. Because we also trust that we... T t hey, don't... It's not all about the front. You see somebody, you someone pick, go and have a chat with them, go and share with them, go and bless them, go and prophesy over them, go and do something over them. You know? So it's not all about just the front. And it's in the home groups. There'll be prophetic in the home groups. So it's all the way through. But I think it's because Stan specifically has gone for that and he's open-handed. So it's it's you know, I don't want to speak about what's unhealthy. I think that's just unhealthy. Guys, we're going to stop right there. Thank you so much.